I'm going to talk this evening about the uh, uh, about the Flowwave facility that we have at the University of Edinburgh, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you about this. I think um, it's probably almost 10 years. In fact, it's 10 years in October since we wrote the original uh, proposal to EPSRC to build the facility. And it's been quite an interesting period of time since we won the money uh, and built the tank. And I really do wish that I was able to show you all around the facility and that we could have a visit to it because a talk on it is a very poor substitute. But I hope that's going to be interesting. So I want to start just by talking a bit about the background. So we've been doing tank testing at the University of Edinburgh since the pioneering work of Stephen Salter in the 1970s when they were developing the, the uh, Edinburgh Duck and, uh, and had to really reinvent ways of testing in tanks in order to be able to do that because the tank testing facilities that were available at the time were not able to be fine enough controlled that you could uh, make small changes to the energy absorption of the device and, and see how that performed in reality. And building on that, uh, they then went on to build a, a larger facility and um, they, they built the wide tank, which you can see on the left. And then later on, we built the curve tank, which you can see on the right. And about the time that the curve tank was built in 2001, Stephen Salter proposed that a circular facility was built that combined waves and tidal currents together. And it was on the basis of that kind of proposal that 10 years later, we, uh, we put the proposal in to build the flow wave facility. And uh, it's now operated by the University of Edinburgh and we provide services to both university and commercial clients. We have a dedicated team of staff and an on-site on workshop and extensive instrumentation, and we've been in operation since 2014. And we have a number of, of party tricks that we can do with the tank, uh, one of which I will show you at, at the end of this, um, of this presentation. So we do most of our day work day-to-day -day work includes the performance and survival assessment of wave energy and tidal energy devices and floating wind devices we also do work on developing measurement technologies for measuring conditions in large tanks and we're involved in the development and guidance of standards and all of those are important activities for us and uh, it's really a a variety of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis which is which is very important to the, to the operation of the tank. So I'm gonna show you a short video now that we made actually before we built the facility. And it shows you uh, based on the engineering drawings that were drawn by Edinburgh Designs, who designed all the mechanical electrical equipment, how the tank works. And so we start off by having wave makers all the way around the outside of the facility. And each of those are individual computer controlled wave makers and they absorb energy in waves that's coming towards them and they create waves. So as it says in the video, the stilling time in the tank is exceptionally fast. That gives us a very high turnaround in tests and we can change the direction of the waves very quickly in a new direction or change the sea state. In a large concrete rectangular tank, you might have to wait 20 minutes or half an hour between tests. We typically have to wait about about five minutes. Uh, we can generate current and the way that the current is generated you'll see in a moment but that allows us to put tidal turbines under the water and to test them and I'll show you an example of that later on in the presentation as well. So underneath the floor of the tank we have 28 flow drives. These are large uh, 1.7 meter diameter impellers and they're all individually controlled and we can drive current across underneath the tank in any direction through a system of turning vanes and across the surface of the tank. And of all the design of the facility, this was the most complicated part to get right. And uh, it enables us to computer control the direction that the flow is going in. It doesn't change as quickly as this animation shows because this animation didn't have to worry about the inertia of two and a half thousand tons of water uh, and what direction it's going in. So we can only rotate the flow quite slowly, but we can then combine that tidal current with waves 
to provide an incredibly realistic simulation of the, uh, of the ocean. And indeed, the Flowo facility is absolutely unique in the world, and there is nothing else like it anywhere. So some people ask the question, why is it 30 meters in diameter and the test section two meters deep? Well, we started off by considering the fruit scaling and the Reynolds scaling that we wanted to apply in testing wave and tidal energy devices. And it turns out that between about one in 20 and one in 40 geometric scaling, that the scaling is well behaved. So if we're operating in one to 20 to one to 40, we can scale Reynolds number and fruit number in, in appropriate ways to, to be able to test devices. And most of our marine energy sites are in 40 to 80 meters of water. So that also scales at about those scales. So two meters deep was the, the, an appropriate depth for the tank. We would like it to have been deeper, but depth is a very expensive thing and you've got to excavate more into the ground and that just puts the price up. So it's a compromise between how much can you afford and what do you need as to the depth of the tank. And 30 meters in diameter was as large as we could get in diameter. And really, again, that's driving, uh, driven by decisions about what you want to test. And at scale, that it gives us a test area of between 340 and 680 meters in diameter at prototype scale. And so we can test large individual devices or arrays of devices in the tank. And again, that's a very important facility. So having looked at all that design, the question is, does it work? And what this video is going to show you is it's going to show you a, a, a low frequency monochromatic regular wave propagating across the tank. Uh, in starting with very still, very clean water. And this is the most difficult thing to do in a circular tank, because if there is any phase difference between the individual wave makers, then those long crested waves would not be long crested. And if there was any significant reflection, you would see the reflections in that animation. So actually, when you first build a tank and you do a lot of calibration work, you spend a lot of time doing very boring individual sea states to calibrate the tank. Once you've got those right, you can build them up. And this is the current generating facility running. So this is current at 1.2 meters a second. The tank is designed to operate waves and current at 0.8 meters a second. And if we went full blast with the wave with the current generators, we can get up to about two meters a second if we want to. That's very frightening and a lot of the building shakes and it's very noisy. So we don't like doing it but 1.2 meters a second is quite typical for current only operations. So in terms of tank testing, we're involved in marine renewables R&D. That's, the, that's what we started trying to do and what the tank was, was built for doing. But there are lots of other applications. So we've been involved in robotics. We're involved in developing and doing tests to help validate computer models. We've been looking at wave and current hydrodynamics. Uh, we've been looking at techniques for measurement. So we've just, we've just had accepted a paper uh, for the proceedings of the Royal Society of London uh, using um, single photon avalanche detectors as an optical wave measuring device. And it can not only measure the wave height, but also the direction that the wave is traveling in, which is, which is quite unique. Um, so to give you an example of some of the tests that we've done, this, is, uh, this was a, a device that we tested for, for a company called QED Naval, who are based in Edinburgh. It's a foundation for tidal turbines. And after doing the tests, this is a small scale model being deployed in the sea. And this is their much larger scale model on the quay side, ready for deployment in, in full scale. So we're part of the process of building up from that small scale to a much larger scale. Uh, as we as we proceed. And this is some video from some tests that were done for Wave Energy Scotland uh, by Quotient, looking at a design where the volume of the hull can be changed um, to, to different conditions. And you can see that we can lift the floor up in the tank, the adjustments can be made to the model, and then the floor can go back down and the test can continue. One of the things about the tank that's very important is its degree of reproducibility. So in these tests, 
the, uh, the, the device is being subjected to exactly the same waves at exactly the same time in exactly the same position in all of those tests. So you can make direct comparisons on a wave by wave basis between the, uh, the high volume and the low volume configurations. And that's very important for testing. Uh, we've done testing and development for uh, for Wave Energy Scotland. So this is the this is the motion device being tested, one of the early designs. Uh, that's a device that is now uh, in, a, in an updated design about to go into the sea uh, in Orkney for, for, for further testing. And we've tested floating wind turbines. And this is a this is a, a floating semi submersible design that we tested for a company called Enerocean. And uh, it mounts two wind turbines on the same semi-submersible platform. And uh, we need to apply wind force to the model, and I'll, I'll explain how we do that later on. But one of the things that's important about the tank is that we have very good motion tracking uh, equipment. So what you can see in this clip of the videos is the rotation of the, of the rotor blades, the motion of the hull, and the motion of the mooring line, all captured using above and underwater quality systems. And again, building on these kind of tests, that, that device was tested at one sixth scale in the ocean in Gran Canaria um, a couple of years ago. We've been involved in much uh, more novel development work. So this is a, this is a, a dielectric elastomer based wave energy device uh, that was tested. Um, for a project called Polywec. Um, it generated the equivalent of 500 kilowatts if we scale up to prototype scale uh, from this diaphragm that you can see moving up and down in the test. And recently we've been doing some testing for Orbital uh, for their floating tidal turbine device. So I'm very grateful to Callum from Orbital for sending me these photographs um, last Monday of uh, the device being craned, in, craned out of the tank on, on Friday. So we're testing all these things because we want to understand the interaction of the marine environment with our, with our devices. And we're doing that to improve the models of the devices and to characterize their performance and to improve our design tools. But the really important thing that we want to do is we want to try and replicate those real environments and then to use them to quantify the forces that are being applied to our uh, device. And in order to do that, we need good quality measurement and we need to care very much about not just the conditions we're um, creating, but the tests that we're performing. So this is an example of the kind of measurement plans that you would have. We're using a lot of wave gauges in here to assess the uh, assess the sea conditions that are passing the device and we're looking at uh, using the quality system at the motions of the device. So that's a, a, a floating tank which has water in it which is sloshing. And this is an ROV being tested and what we did with the ROV is the ROV is supported and held in place using tethers and we're measuring the forces on that. So we can look at the impact of flow and turbulence on the ROV without the danger of it being washed away if the current gets a bit strong for, for its motors to operate against. And you can see the blue light in the water from the underwater quality cameras in operation. We had to do some work on uh, offshore wind turbines and force, and I'm going to show you a video now from one of our clients.
So uh, that's, that's a video that one of our clients put together after their tests, but it gives you an idea of the kind of thing that we're going to do. Now, the title of this talk was about engineering a maelstrom, and the important thing to do that we're trying to do in the tank is not just have a hundred year storm, but have exactly the conditions that we want and to have those conditions that are absolutely repeatable and to have conditions that are absolutely um, representative of the site conditions. And so what I'm going to talk about now is how we replicate those site conditions and, and what we do. So we start off with a lot of data and we need a good data set and we tend to we work with EMEC using BOI data that they've got from their wave sites. And we need good temporal and spatial co coverage with these devices. And we need all the parameters that we can lay our hands on. So we need to know about wave motion, about currents, about wind. We need to know about angular information and turbulence. And there's a lot of measurement that's really needed to do this properly. But once we've got that kind of information, then we can start post-processing it. And there are two different ways that we can do that. So we can apply a statistical representation of the site conditions where we bin lots of different Met Ocean data together. And then we say, well, we have these conditions that are representative of something. That's one way of doing it. And the other way of doing it is to look at time series information and to then try and do spectral or time series analysis and then to recreate exactly those conditions. Um, I'm going to talk about both of the methods that, that we've used. So the standard way of doing binning is just to bin the wave height and the wave period together. And we use significant wave height or, or HM0, the, the spectral mean wave height, and the energy period TE or, or the wave peak period TP. And we bin those together and then we say in those conditions, we have we have a spectrum that's typical of, of waves at the site. But if we start plotting those, and what you can see on the right hand side of this slide here is a whole load of graphs where the black line is the average spectrum in one of those bins, and the grey lines are individual spectrums that were measured by the wave boys. And you can see a huge scatter. So there isn't really such a thing as a mean uh, uh, spectral shape that we can use for, for a particular bin. And so what we do is we start clustering and using computer learning techniques to, to produce representative sea states. And we do that using a single summation model of the waves. And this means quite simply that each frequency of wave must come from a single direction. That's actually a requirement of the tank. So we have uh, in the tank, we have about 4096 different frequency bins that we use. So we could have 4096 different directions, but each frequency must come from one direction. And that allows us to give a, a, a system that we can sum together to give pseudo random waves where we can easily invert the problem. Once we've done that, we can visualize that in software and see what the tanks are going to look like. So you can see here a visualization of a directionally spread sea based on one of those sets of conditions. And the, the animation in blue shows you exactly what you would see in the tank. We also need to do reflection analysis because we don't want waves reflected from the side of the tank or reflected from the models that are corrupting the sea conditions. And so one of the things that we do is we, we have to do this in a, in a multi-directional way. Often in rectangular tanks, people will just use a single direction of reflection analysis but in the curved tank, as you can see here, we can get curved reflections. So we use a, an array of wave measuring devices that are spaced uh, in an unusual way so that we have uh, the distances between them come out as a set of, of points that cover a wide range of areas. And then we can do the inversions and do the wave reflection analysis. And this is an example of the kind of thing that we do. And then we correct the spectrum. So what you can see in here is the black lines are the desired wave energy spectra. And the, the red lines are what the tank measured as the instant wave conditions. And the very, very small green lines down here are what we're measuring as the reflections. And we can correct for those reflections in, in our experiment and get very, very accurate waves. 
So the single summation method that we use is very straightforward in a frequency domain, um, but uh, if, we, if we have time data or data from a wave boy, then we need to use a, a more complicated technique to, to understand what's going on. And we use this uh, path time phase difference uh, model. And so this is, this is an example of wave crests in blue passing those measuring points in the tank. And uh, if we had a single frequency in a single direction, we would, get, uh, we would get something that we could use directly in the single summation method. So this is an example of a wave gauge array that we might use in the tank. We've got eight gauges and the array of that gives us a total of 56 different triangles that we can analyze to get wave direction information. And it's actually getting away from this is one of the reasons that we'd started looking at the photon avalanche detector based wave gauges. So this is an example of wave conditions uh, analyzed using different methods. And the ones that I want you to look at here is this column, which is desired wave conditions. And these ones are the conditions that we measured using the path time phase difference uh, approximation. These are other widely used methods of reflection analysis. And so you can see that we're doing quite well compared to the desired wave conditions, whereas the alternative techniques either uh, are either a bit lumpy in what they're measuring, but get the direction right, or uh, smoother, but get the direction completely wrong. And we can use this to do reflection analysis. So this is an example of instant and reflected waves measured in the tank. And these are the kind of arrays that we use for, for developing uh, and doing those measurements, which is where the picture that you saw earlier comes from. So once we can do this reflection analysis, we need to recreate the sea state. So we start with wave boy data. We gather that and we do a lot of quality assurance and noise reduction and things from, from the data. And we derive statistical parameters and directional spectra. Then we reduce that down using the clustering and, and binning approach. And we come up with a set of representative C states. And then we say, what can we do in the tank? And then we validate those against, against the field data. And this is the set of conditions that we, that we have developed. Each of those spots represents a, a, an appropriately unique um, set of conditions. Now you can see that in some of the bins, there are a large number of spots and in some places the spots are almost on top of one another. So this case here represents two sets of conditions where in one case the waves are predominantly coming from the southeast and in the other case that's a combination, uh, sorry, predominantly coming from the southwest. And in the other case, it's a combination of a southwesterly swell sea and a wind driven northwesterly from a local storm. And if we don't have two sets of conditions in there, we won't we won't actually represent what's going on properly in the ocean. The ones that are marked in red are things that we can't do in the tank. So these waves are too, uh, too, too high frequency for us to model accurately in the tank. Uh, but they're quite low amplitude, so we're probably not interested in them. And these waves up here are too extreme, and we would have waves overtopping the side of the tank and causing flooding. So we, we, we need to avoid, avoid that kind of thing that might damage the equipment. But other than that, we have this set of 37 sea states that we represent uh, the European Marine Energy Centre's wave site with. And that's an example of those different spots that you could see in that previous uh, in that previous bin. So you really can see that these are very, very different conditions, although they all have very similar mean uh, wave energy, uh, mean wave heights and mean uh, wave periods. Again, we do reflection analysis and we check that everything's working properly and we correct the, the wave generation to make sure that we're getting what we actually wanted in the tank. Uh, and we do that validation so that a client knows that they're getting the storm that they wanted every time they want it. And this is what the final sea conditions look like. So we've got this very mixed, very difficult, uh, sea conditions this is quite high energy so if you consider these waves in here some of which are 
are getting on for half a metre high are scaled up by a factor of 26, you're talking about 13 metre high waves. That's quite a spectacular sea condition uh, to be out in. Uh, and so we're really being able to put things to quite a strong test. If we take the uh, if we take a time series based approach, then we did some work with Oxford University looking at the Drupner wave, uh, which hit the Drupner oil uh, offshore oil platform on on New Year's Day. Um, and the waves actually here in this time series is this big peak. And there's been lots of theories about how this wave occurred. Uh, but um, uh, Tom Adcock and Paul Taylor uh, had an idea that it might come about because of crossing sea states and uh, they asked us to test it in the tank because we could do this in, in flow wave and so this is the idea here that you have two sets of waves crossing at an oblique angle and we can do that in our tank so we tried and this is what you see so you can see the wave gauges in here and you can see the crossing waves uh, coming together and this here is that is that very large wave coming out of the sea and when we did this, one of the researchers who was uh, who was taking these photographs said that looks remarkably like the Hosokai wave. Uh, and so we ended up on the front page of the Daily Mail as having recreated the Hosokai wave in in the in in the tank. If we want to think about waves and current, then uh, the tidal turbines might be subjected to, then we have a slightly different problem. And the problem that we have here is that we have nonlinear waves in current. We have very strong wave induced vibration um, variation in the, in the flow velocities. And you can see here some measurements that Brian Seller took at, at EMAC um, some years ago now. Uh, and the blue and yellow lines represent velocity measurements using acoustic Doppler velocimeters. Uh, and the white line at the top is the wave height. And that's in 40 meters of water. Waves affect the current, uh, sorry, current affects the wave shape, and so uh, we need to account for the Doppler shift and the increase in amplitude or decrease in amplitude in the, in the wave conditions, and that's work that we have to do in the tank. And so we start with theory and we, uh, and then we build it up, and then we have to do empirical checking to, to try and, to try and validate this. So if we're doing wave current together, we spend a lot of time uh, doing checks on the sea conditions that the that the device is about to be subjected to and indeed we took a lot of measurements in the tank to characterize what the velocity looks like these are all these were all done by Donald Noble they're point measurements that were taken with an acoustic Doppler velocimeter um, so there are hundreds and hundreds of point measurements at all sorts of different depths taken in the tank over a very, very long period of time in order to get this, these kind of velocity maps. But we can use this together with our knowledge of the wave conditions to predict what's going to happen to the waves in the tank. And once we've done that, we can do some testing. So this is some tests that we did for the Supergen Marine project and for the Floater project. And these are three model tidal turbines that were, that were designed and built and put together. They are really dynamometers rather than power takeoff machines. So they, they have a very accurately controllable motor in them and they've got all sorts of uh, measurements in there for root bending moments and thrust and speed and torque. So we can, we can do a lot of, of measurement with these devices. They're actually due to go back into the tank next week for some more tests. But this is an example of them being lowered into the tank ready for testing. And this is an example of, of them running underwater as an array in, in wave and tidal current conditions. And you can see the waves on the surface here. And sometimes those waves are breaking over the, over the turbines. We're actually running the turbines here in, individually, but they can be electrically connected together. And that's a very interesting thing to do because the electrical motors want to synchronize but the hydrodynamics of the turbines might not make them want to synchronize and so you get very different force profiles on the turbines so i want to draw to a to conclusion here and and i need to thank a lot of people so to start with i'd like to thank tom davy and laura and roman and martin and 
who, who are the current team of, of tank people and uh, Sam Draycott and Donald Noble and Jeff and Brian who've also done an awful lot of work to support these tests and to develop some of the techniques that we've, we've presented. I need to acknowledge the, the significant contribution of the late Ian Bryden and Professor Robin Wallace and Adam Robinson and Ist van Gorgny who together with myself not only won the money to build the facility but did all of the background research to, to design it uh, and to decide how we were going to do those wave and current conditions and what kind of things we were going to do. Uh, the companies of Edinburgh Designs and QED Naval and Quotient and Motion and Eneration and the School of Superior Santana and Orbital and various other people that are on this list have all been involved in testing some of the things that you've seen and I'm very grateful for being able to show you some of their results and I need to particularly thank the Supergen Extra Mile Club for all of their hard work. We couldn't have built it without support from EPSRC Scottish Enterprise and the University of Edinburgh and most of the research work that we've shown you tonight has been funded either by the European Commission or by NERC uh, uh, and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So they say always finish on a high. This is our most famous party trick. It's the opposite of what happens if you throw a stone into the water. The ceiling of the tank is 10 metres above the water surface and that jet of water did hit the surface. And if you want to see more of that, then the slow-mo guys came and filmed in Flowwave uh, with a huge amount of uh, cinema lighting and, and some amazingly professional cameras. So um, I suggest that you have a good look at their video. Uh, I think Kahir said he was going to put it into the chat. So thank you very much. If there are any questions that anybody has to ask or you'd like more information, please ask and I'll do my best to answer. But I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much, David. That was fascinating. Um, let's see if we can move to a gallery view so we get a sense of, of the audience. Um, and if we could have 10 or 15 minutes of questioning um questions so if anyone has a question if you're brave you could uh switch your camera on and, and ask or if you'd rather you could put it in the chat i can see there's one question in the chat already um from a1 who says hello i was wondering how do you scale up the results from the tank to the real real scale water turbine underwater turbines there must be some difference in the effect of viscosity on the turbine model versus real turbines and and you're yeah, absolutely correct there is there is a difference in viscosity because you know, normally if you were if you were just doing the turbine underwater you would want to scale it using um, using reynolds scaling uh, but unfortunately the wave effects scale with the fruit scaling so that's one of the reasons that i said that we have the um the tank at the scale uh, that it's at now, actually, what we do is when we design those tidal turbines, we adjust the design of the blades. So the blades on our tidal turbine are very carefully designed so that they have the same thrust and uh, tip speed parameter curves and torque parameters as the turbines that we're interested in at the full scale. <coughs> and so we have to scale down the blade design to something that will operate in the tank at a different Reynolds number. And so that's the process that we have to go through. Uh, and it's somewhat of a black art, it has to be said. But um, once it's been done, then, then it does work quite well. They do exactly the same thing when they test um, aeroplane um, propeller blades and wind turbines in, um, in wind tunnels as well. They go through the same kind of scaling process. So it's quite well established, but it's a bit of a pain that you have to do it. Okay. Anyone else got a question? I can see Joe. Yeah, can you hear me okay, David? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, I'm very interested to see that you, you look at performance of uh, survival assessment because 
I've having been involved in it for a few years now, it's one of the things everybody seems to ignore. Stick it on the seabed, it'll be fine. Um, and then they find it 20 miles away. Um, <laughs> so, uh, is, does that form a large part of what you do? Um, it forms some of what we do. I wouldn't say it's a large part. It's an important part. And one of the problems that we often have is that you can't necessarily use the same model. So if you're trying to do a power performance assessment, you probably operate with one scale of model. And if you want to, uh, if you want to do a survivability test, you might have to use a different scale of model. Um, sometimes that's because the survival conditions are so extreme that we can't create them at the original scale in the tank. and We need to use a slightly different scale. And sometimes it's also just down to the fact that your production model has got a realistic power takeoff in it and is a very, very expensive piece of kit. And you might not want to subject that to, to the survival sea conditions. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I could jump in with my own question then. So I was fascinated about the programming of this. You know, as obviously there's many moving parts. So yeah. what level of abstraction are you programming? Are there, do you have libraries of subroutines where you say, uh, you know, I want a three knot current and a so-and-so wave at this frequency? Or do you have to get down to the the level of controlling individual flaps. I think I think a lot of it comes down to the incredible wizardry of of the team at Edinburgh Designs. Um, the tank we think that the tank is probably the most complicated piece of electromechanical equipment in Edinburgh in terms of the sheer number of moving parts and, and everything else that's going on in it. Those 168 wave makers are all individually controlled. And actually, they, they all have their own computer controller, which is updating the position of the wave maker all the time. And the, um, the, the, the way that they work is that the force acting on the wave maker is being measured all the time and compared against the model prediction of what the force should be. And if the force is too great, then the wave maker will move backwards to, to, to reduce the force acting on it. And if the force is too little, it will push forward against it. And that's a technique that was developed by, uh, by Stephen Salter and, and co in the 1970s when they were first developing these things. What Edinburgh Designs have done is that they've they've made each of our wave makers is a smart controller, so it's doing that calculation all its time on all all the time on its own account. So in effect, it's coordinated control. And what we have to do when we come to program the tank is we have to say, this is the wave conditions that I want. These are the frequencies that I want. These are the directions that those frequencies are coming from. We do that using a very fairly straightforward um, graphical user interface, though there is a programming language underneath it that you can use if you really want to. Once we've provided that information to the tank, the software then works out what information needs to be given to each individual wave maker. And the wave makers then just get on with what they're doing. So that's the programming level of it. A lot of the time, uh, the, the, the uh, Tom and the team that are operating the tank are tweaking that control model because there are, there are occasions when you have to turn off the absorption ability of a wave maker. If that wave maker's on the side of the tank and a wave is passing it like this, you don't necessarily want it to lean back because it's got a higher force. So there's all sorts of tweaking that has to go on. When we first built the tank, it was described to us as having what we'd done was we'd installed the, the hydrodynamics equivalent of a cathedral organ. You know? And the first time that you've installed your cathedral, cathedral organ and you've switched it on, your organist can go in and sit down. And if they've never played one before, then it's going to sound terrible and they might get something that sounds a bit like chopsticks on the organ. You know? But when you've been practicing playing that particular organ for long enough, then you can do Bach, Staccato and Fugue and it can sound really amazing. And so the main trick is over the last, uh, what are we now, over the last six and a half years has been for the tank team to be learning how to play Toccata and Fugue on the, on, on the tank as, a, as an instrument. And the more work they've done, the more programming they've done, and the, the more development they've done, the more sophisticated things they can do. 
So if we are able to do it this year, we always have the tank open for day, Doors Open Day in Edinburgh, and we run a portfolio of, of party tricks to entertain visitors, and they always come up with new party tricks every year. Okay, um, I can see a few more questions in the chat here. Um, Mike Gray asks, are vessels such as ships ever tested in the tank, or is it mainly renewable energy turbines? Uh, We've, we've mainly tested renewable energy devices. We, there is, uh, and we've done tests with ROVs. We've never tested a vessel, but there's no reason why we couldn't. Uh, it, it's just that typically vessel people test in, in, in uh, towing tank facilities or in, or in, um, uh, in uh, other ocean basins. So we're not necessarily competing with the, with the with the facilities that do that testing, but there's no reason why we couldn't. Okay, Donald asks, um, it's the lecture, the lecture's being recorded and will it be available afterwards? Yeah, the, we have a YouTube channel for the Edinburgh and South East Scotland IMEC -E, um, and perhaps one of my colleagues will put it, the address in the chat if they're able to do that. Uh, the Sir Thomas Cable has asked, sorry, my, you briefly addressed a new system that might be installed instead of the wave gauge system for measurement. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Yes, so um, uh, in conjunction with the Institute for Micro and Nano Systems and some of their PhD students um, and um, uh, Professor Ian Underwood, we've been looking at uh, alternatives for wave gauges. Um, at the moment, we use resisted wire wave gauges, so we're measuring the resistance or the capacitance on a, on a pair of wires immersed in the water. And it's a, it's a physical intrusion into the water, so under high current conditions, that can be problematic. So uh, one, of the things, one of the things we've been looking at for a long time is, are there optical methods that we can use? And um, Ian Underwood was chatting to me about these um, uh, what do they call them, um, SPADs, the single photon avalanche detectors. They're used a lot for range detection. So if you've got a car with a reversing sensor in it, there's probably a SPAD in there somewhere. Some of them are ultrasound and some of them are optical. And so we said, well, what happens if we hold one above the water? And it turns out that it doesn't quite work because the, the default ones have an infrared laser in them, which just gets absorbed by the water. So uh, one of the research st students from, from IMNS had a go at using some, some uh, low power lasers of other colors. And we managed to uh, take a measurement with this camera of, of the laser reflecting from the water surface. Because you're not measuring with a single pixel, you're measuring with, a, with an array of, of detectors, just like you are in a digital camera, you can actually measure the time at which the light arrives at, on that detector, because it's a time of flight measurement, um, at different times on different pixels and that allows us to measure the slope of the water and the, and the propagation of the wave front not just the wave height immediately under the sensor so that's that's how it works um, in a in a fairly brief way so so that's 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 it more details will be available very soon in the proceedings of the Royal Society of London okay thank you uh, there was a previous question that I just want to answer, uh, which was that Ross had asked, what's the competition for tank time like and how do we pr prioritise? Um, it's quite straightforward. Uh, the tank is fairly busy. So, you know, if somebody phoned me up and said, I want to be in the tank tomorrow, the answer is going to be probably not. Um, most work comes in, uh, in, in three months uh, ahead booking or, or or a little bit longer and some academic research projects are booked in uh, you know a couple of years in advance depending on 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 funding and, and how people are planning things so we are pretty busy and we're busy I think uh, we're probably booked up solidly now until about June and that's pretty typical so by the time we get to June we'll, we'll know what we're doing until the end of the year there's a little bit of flexibility because tanks uh, tests move around. There is no prioritisation. We're like a hotel, so if you get your room booking in early, then you get you know you get the room at the time that you wanted to book it, rather than you know someone else coming along. That the hotel will be full. Um, <clears throat> but 
the amount of work that goes into preparing to get into the tank it's very unusual for people to say I want to be testing tomorrow so we don't normally have people being disappointed so that's the way it works in terms of academic and industrial work it's about 50 50 that's not a conscious decision that it's going to be 50 50 it's more or less the way that it's fallen out so so that's that okay. and another question from a1 uh, relating to scaling was it ever considered to use something other than water as the liquid in the tank uh, yeah we thought about it um, but uh, we need two and a half thousand tons of it um, 25 yeah 25,000 cubic meters um, it, it's a, a, sorry two and a half thousand cubic meters of it and water's cheap <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's corporation pop uh, we just poured in an awful lot of Edinburgh drinking water out of a fire hydrant into the tank um, and uh, uh, we obviously had to tell the water authority that we were going to do that scottish water don't like you just filling a hole in the ground with 2500 cubic meters of water overnight actually it took a month to fill it but it also it doesn't corrode our equipment it doesn't it doesn't you know it, it's 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 a known quantity and it's it is quite good and we look after it so yeah. well. and we're rarely short of water in edinburgh <laughs> yes indeed there's a question here i don't understand i the um the link to the YouTube channel has been put in the chat and yes. so this recording will appear there in a few days time. Um, yeah. oh, that so, might be the slow-mo guys, but it might be tonight's talk because Gehr hasn't said which one it is. <laughs> I think the slow-mo -mo guys were, well, we could put them find out. There's a question here. Sorry, the the slow-mo guys were earlier. Right, okay. That's, that's one of the YouTube channel um, talks. Okay. So my chef, my Cello asks, is there any way PIV can be done? Um, yeah. uh, we've talked about it a lot. Um, we did some tests with um, LA Vision uh, looking at a white light PIV system, which works really well. Uh, but it was a very much a sort of cardboard and string uh, prototype that they brought along to test. So we know that that will work. But um, PIV with lasers is very problematic because of the laser safety in the tank. We've got a very large, we've got a very large tank hall, and uh, protecting people against the kind of lasers that you need to use would be very, very problematic. So, so I think if it's traditional PIV, the answer is probably no. What's the acronym PIV mean? Um, particle imaging velocimetry. Ah. Okay, and let's make this the last question. Uh, do you think flow wave can be applied to the study of di the dynamic response of submarine slope or submarine lands landslides? Oh, okay, Under underwater movement of Earth, I guess. Yes. So, so there are two answers to that question. Uh, the first answer is probably it could because you could build some kind of bathymetry in the tank and look at the behavior of 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 something on that on that surface practically we wouldn't want to because um if you're going to do that somebody's going to want to put sediment into our tank and we don't want sediment in the tank in fact we do an awful lot to try and make sure that we don't have any in the tank because it would play absolute havoc with our flow drive system and we'd never get it out again so so uh the answer is you probably could but we probably wouldn't let you <laughs> yes but no um okay i think we've had our money's worth from our speaker this evening so i'll ask professor richie to say a few words of of thanks okay thank you uh, jonathan uh well it behoves me on behalf of the membership and the committee to thank professor ingram for his fascinating talk on the uh, flow wave ocean energy facility Unfortunately, in these difficult times, as you said at the beginning, David, it wasn't possible to arrange a visit to, the, to see this, but uh, you're informative and I'm sure everyone will agree, very enjoyable presentation has certainly enlightened us regarding its extensive capabilities and no doubt whetted our appetite for uh, future visits uh, when things get back to some kind of normality. And I'm sure there'll be a big demand for that looking at the the attendance this evening, the excellent attendance this evening. 
so we can only admire the nature and scale of this unique experimental uh, and test environment that you've you've given us an idea of, which combines wave and and current effects, uh, and uh, you've given us an idea of the wide range of academic and industrial work that's done through standards development, statistical and time series analysis models, uh, which can be then used for surface and subsea fluid flow replication, scale model, functional testing, particularly of large devices and large arrays using realistic waveforms through to the development and application of novel motion tracking and sensing techniques to evaluate and determine scale model performance and physical hydrodynamic wave and current analysis. So you've given us a really broad spectrum of what it's capable of, as well as a really good idea of uh, the actual facility itself. And it's been more than a substitute uh, for a visit, I'm sure. I mean, one of the things that really impressed me was the, the change over time from one trial to the next trial with minimum stilling time taking less than five minutes. The, the flexibility that must give you is, uh, must be incredible. We also tend to look at this research environment with a focus on what we can see in the surface. Uh, but this capability, importantly, as you've shown us, also extends to the investigation and analysis of subsea currents and wave, wave effects as well, which uh, I find particularly interesting. Anyway, I'm sure you'll all agree that David has given us a, an excellent, informative and enjoyable presentation. And uh, if I could ask the, the, uh, the meeting organiser if we could unmute all the microphones so that uh, you can all join me in showing him our grateful thanks in the traditional more, uh, manner. Thanks again, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. What do you, Jonathan? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last, Thank you very much, I'll David. close the meeting by reminding everybody that our next talk is on the 9th of March and it's entitled The Measure of All Things by uh, a speaker who for many years was a principal scientist at NPL, the National Physical Laboratory in London. Um, I've seen Dr. De Podesta talk before and he can make seemingly dry subjects like the measurement of temperature or velocity or acceleration or pressure. Um, absolutely fascinating. He's a hilarious, informative, gifted speaker. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. The 9th of March. Okay, thank you very much. Could the committee hang on and um, we'll have a quick meeting after this. Thank you very much.